Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duarte. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Success Thursday this week, all the way from Berlin in Germany, Maximilian Datzer, a.k.a. Max. Hey, Max, welcome back. Hi. So, Max, on Thursdays, we talk success. And uh, first, of course, we want to know what's your favorite retrospective format and why? That's a good question. So the easy answer is I don't have any favorite format because I'm always trying to prepare it, like depending on what happens in the sprint, then I try to adapt it. But one that's relatively easy and it's connected to Scrum values. So all of my teams, I try to talk about Scrum values and why they are um, important, like openness, respect. Like some are straightforward, but even something like focus, there people struggle a little bit to kind of comprehend why is this even in the Scrum Guide? Like why is focus so important? So I always do a session where I explain these values and how they are connected to the Scrum framework and how we are going to lift them. And then in a retro, I just have the values as the keys and ask the team, how did we live by our values today? Like in in this sprint, can you uh, name good examples when we were open or when we showed respect? Can you have negative examples? And then just see to get a feeling of a pattern that emerges there and then we can talk about open examples and how we can foster this kind of behavior so how can we get more of that and when there's like negative behavior how can we improve there and just get like tangible action items um there that helps us to put value out faster and working better together as a team and this is like one of the easiest formats and it works really well in my opinion so yeah i can always recommend that Absolutely. And uh, a great and simple in-depth conversation. Sometimes, of course, uh, th- this conversation is not necessarily focused on a specific aspect of what the team is doing, but it kind of opens a, a, a series of topics that might be relevant, both dynamic-wise, so like how the team uh, interacts with each other and, and with outsiders, as well as uh, then later on also through practices, right? Like, uh, for example, the aspect of focus. We can talk about whip limits. We can talk about having the whole team working. So what is the word swarming on stories rather than working independently, like we talked about on Tuesday about the front end slash back end team separation. Yeah, I, I see how powerful it can be to, to talk about things that we don't always talk about in retrospectives. So uh, Max, now we turn our attention to success because at the end of the day, that's why we do the retrospectives, right? To try to reach a successful outcome in our roles as Scrum Master. So tell us a little bit more about what you feel is the definition of success for Scrum Masters? That's a tricky question. So for me, it one thing that I try to measure is like team morale, how satisfied they are, are they with working in the team and how much do they like the work and see a meaning in that. And we have short so way that we always fill out mid sprint and that's something that I track and in best case, it, it's increasing. So this is one of the, how I would measure my success. If the team is just general, has a better moral, liking to work together. One other straightforward metric is um, cycle time. It's not really just connected to my work, but in general of the team. But what I would expect when I enter a team is that we have a reasonable good enough cycle time, which would be if I had to use a rule of thumb, if we have a 10-day sprint, I would expect a cycle time of five days. So half of the sprint to get some kind of good feedback loop. And most teams that I coached are not there when I start. So the measure of success is cycle time decreasing to an acceptable level. Another met I don't want to call it a metric, but it's change initiatives that are pushed by teammates and not by me. And I can give you an example there. I talk with my team about the sprint review and how it's supposed to be. And suddenly they were like, yeah, we we should have this. We should improve our sprint review because right now it's just a 30 minute meeting, which is a demo meeting. So they showed progress to internal stakeholders, get like a clap on the back and like, good job. And then we continue. And right now they are 
self-organizing around this issue, talking with management, um, talking with marketing, sales, and even try to get customers in there. I don't, I'm not in this initiative at all. Like I provide help and support, but they are doing this on their own. Uh, I try to be humble, but I'm really proud of them and think this is also some of the success I want to see when I coach a team that I'm not the one who's pushing change to them. And they just accept it and also run with it. And sometimes even say, we don't need you to do something else. Uh, we call you if we need help. And then they're just doing it. Yeah, that's a great sign, right? Like, don't worry, we can handle this. We'll call you when you need you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, great examples as well. When you were looking at this uh, cycle, uh, I, I ask this because not not a lot of people talk about this cycle time metric. And I want to explore that a little bit more. So you said, you know, rule of thumb should be about five days for a 10 day sprint. What other things do you look for in that cycle time metric? So in general, we have a tool that gives us like different kind of graphs, like cumulative flow diagram, cycle time scatter plot. And we just look at patterns that emerge there. We also committed on a percentile. So we say, so 85% of our items right now are finished after seven days. So we try, this is more or less our commitment point. We want to finish our items before they hit the seven day mark. And it just helps to have more valuable uh, conversations sooner because what we, the, the team used velocity before, and then there was like an item that had five story points and then one day before the sprint and someone said yeah i can't finish it but then it was more or less too late like we can't do anything there and then it's just it's a spillover but as soon as we switched to cycle time we had this feedback loop where we like we started with a rule we want our cycle time to be three days that's not achievable right now but at least after three days we asked like this ticket is still in in our process is it too big? Should we pair program it? Is it blocked somewhat? Like we had all these conversations so much sooner and this helped us to avoid spillovers most of the time. They still tend to happen right now, but it's getting better. And we're just getting better sized stories. We're getting more predictable even. And I guess that this is why I'm such a fan of cycle time because it helps you to be actionable. Absolutely. And great examples of that too. Thank you for sharing that, Max. You're welcome. Part of a successful Scrum Master job is to help the product owner. Tomorrow we explore that critical role in Scrum, the product owner role. Tune in to learn about the product owner anti-patterns, what you can do to help the product owner, and a real life example of what a great product owner is and what made it so. Tomorrow on our Friday product owner episode. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.